You know, do-it-yourself looks so attractive on paper. It does. Until you actually get into it, right? Then you start realizing maybe it's not that good of a deal. So the answer, true or false, is false. False. What you want to do, and I want to change your mind here if you're somebody who said, no, no, I'm a contractor. I do the work myself. Make the most money that way. I'm going to challenge your thought right now. You want to use your time at the highest per hour rate, right? And sub out the rest. So what is the best use of your time? What's the best use of your time? Think about this for a minute. The best use of your time is to go out and look for those $63,500 deals, right? If it took you cumulatively a month between making offers, looking at houses, driving for dollars, um, answering phone calls, negotiating, what, all the things that we teach people to do at our workshop, if it took you a month in total, but you landed a deal that made you $63,500, would that be worth a month of your time? Now, yes, you still have to flip it. You still have to go through all that process, but just the finding part took you a month. And you're gonna make $63,000 for that? That's worth your time. That's a lot better than laying tile or painting the wall, right? Or digging up the yard out front or doing landscaping because you think you're saving a thousand bucks. You're not. I'm challenging your thought process here to say, I was the same as you. The first two houses, Amber and I did all the work ourselves. And I quickly realized that sucked. I quickly realized that that's not good. It's not good for your health. My back still has issues this day from putting a countertop in on the first house. I had no business doing that kind of work, but I thought I was saving money. But I wasn't saving money because I wasn't looking for my next deal. And consequently, in our first year, we did one deal and then three the next year, but it took us a long time to find that next deal because I was too busy working on the business and not thinking about how to get the next deal. Does that make sense? So always find the highest use of your time, the most per hour rate, that's where you want to put your time and sub out the rest. Building your contracting team. This is one of the toughest things that we go over. And Amber made a comment about contractors before, and we have a love-hate relationship sometimes because there's, there's, there's some good ones. There's a lot of bad ones out there. Even you contractors who are watching today are saying to yourself, I know, there are good ones. Like, you're, if you're here, you're probably a good one, right? But there's a lot of people that are not so good. So... How do you do this? Well, number one, use referrals to locate the best contractors. That's a, that's a, you know, rather than use yellow pages or advertisements or flyers along the side of a, the highway, I recommend that you use referrals to find the best contractors. Here's another value tip. Go to Home Depot early in the morning to find the best ones, right? Go to Home Depot early in the morning to find the best contractors. Now, you always want to use a contract that protects you and includes penalties. You cannot have handshake agreements with contractors. You don't have it when you buy a house, so why would you have it when you renovate a house? You spend sometimes just as much money doing that. So be smart and always have a contract that protects you, and I'm going to recommend that you include penalties. Penalties for deadlines. If they don't hit deadlines, there's a daily penalty. Daily penalties can help motivate people to do the right thing. Okay, so that's important to have in there. You always want to provide them with a detailed scope of work. A detailed scope of work. So you want to lay out exactly what they need to be doing. What, what skew do they use? You know, what paint color? What skew is that? What, what skew for the bathroom light? What skew for the uh, kitchen cabinets, right? What skew, what color countertop? What style countertop? What color roof? You know, whatever it might be. You want to be very specific in your scope of work. You want to treat this like a business. You don't want to just say, hey, make it look good, right? It's your business. You have to own that. So make sure you put together a scope of work. And then you want to manage the contractor, right? You want to manage the contractor. Once you lay out the plan and the specifics for what you need, then you have to manage the contractor to deliver that plan. Does that make sense? Right? So that's what you want to do. You want to manage that contractor to get that done. And here's a tip. This tip alone, if I never see you again, if you just come to the free, we never see you again, this tip will save you tens of thousands of dollars and all kinds of headache. Never pay money up front. In your contract, never pay money up front, especially not large chunks of money. Okay? But the contractors can be in a tough spot too, so they might need a little bit of money for good faith, but we give a small amount of good faith payment after the first day of work is done. That's how we do it so nobody loses. There's a little, little tip you just learned today, okay? You learned lots of tips today, right? Just for free. So I wanna make sure you take that. So we dive into a lot more of this process at the workshop. We dive right into this process of the workshop and really dive in 
Uh, we spend a couple hours actually in this section going over different kinds of paperwork and different forms and there's some training videos we play and it really goes over the different forms you need for contractors uh, and all that. So it's, it's a process and again, we don't have time to do all of that here today. We're doing as much as we can to give you as much value as we can, but this is one of those areas where I'm gonna give you a high level and at the workshop, we're gonna dive into more of that. Find, fun, fix, and flip. Flip, flip is the next one. Now, I might open your eyes here to some things you didn't know you didn't know. So I hope you enjoy this section. Most people think that they flip houses just like what you see on HGTV, because that's the pretty version, right? You watch these shows on TV and they buy a house, they fix it up and they flip it. And there's, oh, that's great. That's how you make money. And that's what we thought for years. But did you know there are many other ways to flip a house after you buy it? Here's some examples. As is, as is, okay? You can buy a house and sell it without ever touching it. We give several examples at the workshop of this and we talk about it. It's pretty cool actually, but there are many houses that we've bought almost sight unseen, but we know we bought it cheap enough where we can sell it to somebody else. And so that's a way you can buy a house and literally sell it to somebody else, flip a house as is. You can do what's called a quick flip. Okay, a quick flip is when you do very little to a house. We recently had a house where we just put uh, some work on the back porch, put a new hot water heater in, sold it, and made a $45,000 profit. We just fixed a couple of things so that, so that somebody with a bank loan could come in and buy it. Those two things were impeding somebody that was trying to buy with a bank loan. They couldn't buy it. So we went and bought the house, put those things in, and then sold it for a whole lot more to somebody who could get a loan on the house. But before that, they couldn't get a loan. People say, well, I don't understand. Like, why, why, wouldn't they, why wouldn't the seller do that? I don't know. I don't care. They don't want to do it. Maybe they just, they, I, don't, I don't know what the situation was. They may have been older. They may have been in a state. They may have been out-of-state owners. They didn't care, right? That's a motivated seller. They were trying to sell the house and loans kept falling through. Does this make sense? Loans were falling through because banks are saying, there's no hot water heater and that back porch is unsafe. We're not, gonna, we're not gonna give you a loan for the house. So when the seller, instead of saying, get that fixed, called us and said, will you buy my house? You bet. Bought the house for like 60 grand, whatever it was, put a couple thousand dollars into it and then sold it for like 150, whatever, whatever that math is. It made like $45,000 and all was said and done. Just by doing a couple simple things. Because we found what? A motivated, Seller. I'm sure you said seller, so now you know. Motivated seller. Cosmetic flip. Cosmetic is just that. Nothing major. No roof work. We call it no majors. No furnace, no roof, no new kitchens, you know, uh, no new bathrooms. Just simply clean it up. Cosmetic flip. Um, we do it right. One thing we teach out of the gates, so I'm going to make sure we're all clear about this, in case we never see each other again, which I think many of us will see each other again. But in case we don't, you have to do this business right. You gotta do it with honesty, integrity, and character. If we find a problem, we fix it. We never hide anything. We don't go looking for problems, but if we do find something, we fix it, okay? So in a cosmetic flip, as long as you know, you're not tearing walls out, you probably won't find any other problems. So you just paint it up, make it look good, clean it up, boom, okay? That's a cosmetic flip. And of course, a full renovation. Full renovation, that's what you see on TV. That's when you buy a house, you go through and put a new kitchen, a new bathroom, or new bathrooms. Um, you put new carpet, new floor, right? Whatever it might be. You, you, uh, you fix walls. You, you may put an opening or pass through from the, from the kitchen to the dining room. A lot of things you could do in a full renovation, but that is a great way to get a lot of money out of a renovation, a lot more work, but you can do it. And then we have what's called a value add, a value add flip. Value add means now you want to add an extra bathroom. Maybe you want to add an upstairs. Maybe you want to add a second level all together, right? Not, I said upstairs, I meant upstairs bedroom, but you want to add a second level, whatever it might be. This is adding value to the house, which will create more profit for you. Now, that can be risky. You have to make sure you know what you're doing because you can over renovate in that case. People say, well, I'm gonna put a second level on. You might not get your money back out of that deal. So you have to know what you're doing with that, right? That's not for rookies, but that's a way that you can also flip a house. And last but not least, my favorite is rentals. Rentals. So let's talk about the last F, or last, it's not an F actually, but find, fun, fix, flip, and hold. So the last one, not, uh, but uh, not at all least, is my favorite, which is hold. I told you we're going to teach you how to build a massive portfolio of rentals at our workshop. I mean, it's probably one of the most sought after presentations after somebody sees it. They're like, oh my God, I'm going to actually show you a spreadsheet 
that you can predict your future by how many houses you buy and without ever using your own money and without ever being a landlord. Now, this has been coined the Burr method, the Burr method. Here it is. Buy, renovate, rent, refinance, repeat. That's it. So you buy a house, then you renovate that house, then you rent it out, put a tenant in there, then you refinance it and take your money back out of that house, and then you repeat that cycle. Now you just took all the money back out, you buy another house, and you do it again. It's called the Burr method. I'm telling you that the passive income in life, this is where it's at, right? Passive income is where it's at. It's money that comes in while you sleep. Listen, flipping houses is great. Making that large chunks of money is great. Wholesaling is great. Making smaller chunks, but chunks of money for just turning over, turning over deals. That's all great. Wealth, true wealth. Pam talked about leaving a legacy for her family. Pam's got an incredible rental portfolio being built, right? She's leaving a legacy for her family. Our students are leaving legacies for their families and they're living the legacy now because they have passive income. It's income that comes in month after month after month because people pay their rent. People pay their rent, even through COVID, even when they weren't allowed to pay rent. Most of our tenants out of, out of dozens and dozens of rentals, only a couple people didn't pay because people still want a place to live and we still get an income off that. It's income that comes in while you sleep. I think you need to understand the importance of that and the value for what we teach with that. So we just sort of touched on this and Pam talked about it, you know, building wealth and legacy.